Hello everybody, this is Dan Trotter, Pretty Good Bible Studies. The video you are about to see is an overview of Orthodox Preterism. Well, what is Preterism? Preterism is a system of eschatology which is being adopted more and more by conservative evangelicals as an alternative to the prevailing futurist eschatology. Preterism states that most of the eschatological discourses in the New Testament were aimed at events that were to occur in AD 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to give you an overview of the overview. This is an overview of the projected uh, playlist dealing with uh, Orthodox Preterist eschatology. Well, I'm just going to uh, tell you what I'm going to talk about in this introductory video. First of all, I'm going to make an apology for eschatology. Many people think that eschatology shouldn't be studied because it's confusing. They say they're pan-millennialist. It'll all pan out in the end, and they don't care, and it's too confusing, and I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to submit to you that that is an utterly unscriptural view. The second thing we're going to talk about is uh, I'm going to talk about uh, is a is uh, what are the topics in the series that we're going to cover? And thirdly, I'll talk about terminology that is necessary to understand before uh, before we can discuss eschatology. And the fourth thing I'm going to talk about is the scope of the series. I'm going to try to keep the scope narrow enough to make es uh, a complicated eschatological subject somewhat simple. Now. Let me start here by making an apology for eschatology, and then I will show how I, myself, in trying to escape pan-millennialism, uh, went on my own eschatological journey to, to end up where I am now. But first of all, let me state that pan-millennialism just will not do. It's understandable, however, because a century and a half of futurism has produced nothing but fear and confusion. Fear, what happens if Jesus comes back and I'm sinning? I know you felt that, or maybe you've heard other people say that. How about the confusion? Are you pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-mill, post-mill, all the millions of terms out there that nobody can understand and nobody can resolve? Well, it's understandable that people would just throw their hands up in despair. However, I will submit that that is not scriptural. Where does the Bible teach this? Does Jesus ever say that? In the, he gave us the Olivet Discourse, a long discourse. Was he just bumping his gums for no purpose? He did that for a purpose. He gave us the, uh, that teaching for a purpose. And how about John in the book of Revelation? He not only gave us the whole book, uh, he said uh, we would be blessed if we read it in chapter 3 and verse 1. And Jesus said there that, uh, we were t t that, um, that the book was to be read aloud in order to spread the message. There's nothing apologetic there about eschatology at all. How about Daniel? He gave us the whole book of Daniel. Half of the book of Daniel is all about eschatology. We're just supposed to throw that out? How about Paul when he said in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching? He didn't say all non-eschatological Scripture was useful for correction and reproof and doctrine. Well, I realized that it was not proper just to throw my hands up in, in despair and say, I don't understand this. So I was determined to figure out what the answer to all this stuff was. I was raised a pre-trib dispensational futurist. I read uh, uh, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey with appropriate awe and respect. I went to all the prophecy movies and the Bible studies and so forth. And I was thoroughly brainwashed into the system. And one day when I was either in high school or early college, I can't remember, I read Matthew 24, 34, which is the favorite preterist verse. This is when Jesus, after reciting the events of the Olivet Discourse, he said, This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Well, those things that were mentioned were the Great Tribulation, uh, one will be snatched and uh, uh, two will be snatched and one will be left behind, the earthquakes, the lightning and the sign of the Son of Man in, in the heavens and all that, all those, all that stuff, the famines, the wars, the rumors of wars, all that stuff was supposed to happen before 8070, not at the end of the world. And so I became very confused by that verse. And that I found out later that C.S. Lewis said that verse was the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. I know that I think it was Albert Schweitzer who 
uh, began to lose his faith. He said, he said that Jesus made a mistake. He was wrong. I know that R.C. Sproul had trouble with this. I believe I heard him say uh, when he was in seminary, he had trouble with this verse. He later, he's a preterist now, and so he doesn't have trouble with it anymore. But I certainly had trouble with it. And the more I listened to and read how Lindsay type prophecy and uh, left behind um, type of uh, uh, es eschatology, I started to say this stuff is not biblical. This stuff is science fiction. They kept telling me to look for an Antichrist. But I look in the Scripture, I don't see an Antichrist. There is no the Antichrist in the Scripture. There is no revived Roman Empire with ten nations and a 200 million man army. And all this stuff that uh, mainly is the, the product of a fevered eschatological imagination, but not Scripture. And so I'm not, I was not satisfied at all. So I became an eschatological Gnostic. But I was determined one day to find the answer. And um, I recall when I was at seminary, Uh, well, before before I go into that, I, I, let me mention that I studied futurist eschatology for eight years, um, and I was just as confused afterwards as when I started. And it never occurred to me that the reason I was confused is that the, my very starting point was flawed. I bought into futurist premises and then went looking for a futurist solution. It never occurred to me that maybe the premises were completely erroneous at the very foundation uh, of my star of my search. Uh, what if all of this stuff about pre-trib and post-trib and mid-trib, what if all that stuff was irrelevant? And uh, what if the Jesus was not talking about the future at all? What if he was talking about the events of AD 70? Well, I never had heard of the word preterist, except rarely. I, I, when I was at uh, seminary, I heard the word, I think, once, and I never saw any books in the library about it, never heard any teaching but when I was about you know, 50 years old or so, a friend of mine introduced me to the concept, and I remembered the word, and I started studying, and I think I found a key. This is the key that unlocks the mystery. Now, if you think this is a radical statement, if you think that I'm being presumptuous, well, just stick with me, and you'll see. I've taught this three times uh, to a live audience, to people who are presumably futurists, and I was expecting extreme blowback and criticism and questioning and wailing and moaning and gnashing of teeth. And instead, I just got a deer in the headlight looks like, wow, maybe it's true. So we'll see. All right, next, let me tell you briefly what I plan to cover in this uh, playlist, in this series on preterist eschatology. I'm going to talk about the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and the parallel passages. Uh, passages. I'm going to talk about the book of Revelation. I'm going to talk about the book of Daniel, not verse by verse, but I'm going to go into fairly uh a fairly a deep analysis of those two books. And then I'm going to do a miscellaneous video, which I call Preterist Pot Potpourri, where I will cover miscellaneous preterist topics. And then last of all, I'm going to cover the hyperpreterist heresy, which I want to talk about now because I want to make very clear that I am not a hyperpreterist. A hyper now, the reason that's necessary is because Hyperpreterists are everywhere. They're all over the internet. You do a search on preterism, you're likely going to come up with a bunch of eschatological garbage, heretical garbage. I remember at one point I quit telling people about my preterist eschatology because I got tired of them going to the internet and coming up with, with nonsense and asking me, did I believe that, that Jesus was going to come back bodily at the end of time? Well, so let me go briefly into this just to make my point clear. Hyperpreterists say that Christians were resurrected at eighty seventy. Living Christians had uh, received their res resurrection in eighty seventy, which, of course, means that there's no resurrection of dead at the end of time. And that means that they are heretics because, as the Nicene Creed says, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And the reason the Creed says that is because it's clearly in the Scripture. All you have to do is read 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, resurrection is an easy subject to teach if you're not a heretic. Well, hyperpreterists deny that, and so uh, they're heretics, and I don't want to have anything to do with them. Now, here's what else they believe. They say that the following things occurred in AD 70. First of all, Jesus is going to come back physically. Excuse me, they don't all say physically. They say he came back in AD 70. They disagree on how he came back, but they say he came back in AD 70. 
They say that Christians, the living Christians then were resurrected in AD 70. They say that the earth was released from its bondage to decay as per Romans 8 in AD 70. And they said the devil was thrown into the lake of fire in AD 70. So therefore there's no more demon possession today, no more spiritual warfare. And this world with its fire ants and its, and its hurricanes and its floods and its famines and it's uh, red, redness with tooth and claw. All of that is, that's the best it's ever going to be because it's, the earth is already released from decay. Well, I consider that absolutely absurd on its face. I mean, are you kidding me? This is nonsense. So that, I want to be very clear. I am not a hyper-preterist heretic. Now, next, I want to talk about some terminology that we need to know in order to discuss this uh, topic. And this is uh, very useful, I think, because I had trouble uh, sifting out the different positions without knowing this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the terminology with regards to futurism, historicism, and preterism. And next of all, I'm going to talk about the ter terminology referring to the word preterist. What exactly do we mean? Now, there's three basic eschatological schemes. Now, all of these schemes are analyzed from the point of view of the person today who is studying the issue today. For example, futurism. Futurism says that compared to where we are today in the 21st century, most eschatological events will happen at the end of time. Preterism uh, is the opposite. Preterism, refer the word preterism means having to do with the past. And so what we do is we uh, look at events compared to where we are now in the 21st century. We look at events in the past, and, and more particularly in the past at 8070. Now there's a mediating position, historicism, which says that most, not all, but most eschatological events happened at the Reformation in the 16th century. So uh, let me show you how this works as it's laid out on a continuum here. First of all, we have hyperpreterists who say that all eschatological, eschatological events happened in AD 70. Next, as we move toward the future, uh, we say that most events happened in AD 70. Orthodox preterists say that. However, Orthodox preterists reserve some events for the future, such as Jesus' bodily return. Next, we have historicists. They say, as we move from the 70 AD to the, to the 16th century AD, historicists say that most events happened at the time of the Reformation. And then we've got your typical futurist living today who say that most events happened at the end of time. Uh, compared to where we are now. And then there's even more an extreme futurist view, Orthodox Jews, who say that all eschatological events happened at the end of time, including the first return of the Messiah, because he has not come back to set the kingdom up according to them. Well, of course, we, what we want to do is reject the extreme positions here, hyper-preterist and hyper-futurist, hyper-preterist and Orthodox Jews. Uh, I'm, going, I'm not going to talk about historicism too much, because I think that's a, sort of a minority view. And... Uh, I think that historicism is sort of a geo ethnocentric, geocentric type of eschatology that tries to take uh, universal uh, eschatological truth and, and, and pigeonhole it into a particular era of history and, and a particular place in history, namely Europe during the time of the Reformation. And those were important times, but I really don't think that the prophets were talking about Turks uh, invading Europe. So we're going to focus then, therefore, on orthodox preterism and futurism. Now let me make a special note about the term hyperpreterist. Still talking about terminology here. Hyperpreterist and heretical preterist, thus terms that orthodox preterists use. Hyperpreterists don't use those terms because they're pejorative. They just call themselves preterist. Well, what they've done is they've hijacked a perfectly decent term. I mean, I consider myself a preterist, but I hate to use the term because the heretical preterists have hijacked it. And what they've done is they call themselves preterist or full preterist, and they distinguish us by calling us partial preterist. Now, a full preterist, that, that word sounds so warm and fuzzy and complete and mature, whereas partial preterism sounds like an orthodox preterist is somehow lacking in something. He's not firing on all cylinders. He's incomplete. So those terms are pejorative too. Well, I'm not going to use a pejorative term to describe my position. And I wish that Orthodox preterists would adopt the same habit and not 
give away a rhetorical advantage to people who are de denying the resurrection of the dead. So when I use the term preterist, I mean orthodox preterist, but I, unfortunately I'm going to have to put the adjective on the term in order to make it clear that I'm talking about orthodox preterism and not heretical preterism. All right. Now, what is the scope of this projected series of studies on orthodox preterism? Well, I need to narrow it down. I'm going to try to avoid talking about futurism and historicism as much as I possibly can. Uh, I'm going to have to mention futurism as I go through. It's inevitable, but my main goal will not be to refute futurism so much as it will be to establish preterism. By the very fact of establishing preterism, futurism becomes thereby refuted. So to keep it simple, I'm just going to focus on one thing, which is orthodox preterism. I'm not going to talk about millennial theories, and I'm not going to speculate about what might happen in the future. Let me uh, show you that graphically, the things that I'm going to avoid. I'm going to avoid futurism, the millennium, talking about the millennium, talking about historicism and, and, and future specu speculation. I'm going to try to stay away from it. Futurism talks about black helicopters and nuclear bombs. I don't care about that. Uh, futurism loves to speculate about who's going to be in the ten nation revived Roman Empire and when uh, what's going to happen to the nation of Israel and all that. Well I'm not going to pontificate about the future. To me people who talk so confidently about the future remind me of those people with the crystal balls, the red hands. They're fortune tellers. I don't listen to fortune telling eschatology. Um, I'm not going to talk about the millennium. Uh, now I don't believe in the millennium personally because the millennium to me is a fantasy land, a fantasy land that requires glorified saints, unglorified saints, and unglorified lost people to live together in some kind of a strange society. And I think that sounds like science fiction to me too, and I don't believe in it. But it doesn't matter. You can be a, uh, you can believe in a, that's a pre-mill view of the millennium. You can be a pre-millennialist and be a preterist at the same time, so I'm not going to fry those fish. Uh, I'm not going to worry about whether you're on-mill or post-mill. Now, most preterists are post-mill because preterism by nature is, a, is, a, is an optimistic eschatology because all of that bad stuff that happens in Revelation and in, in the Olivet Discourse, it's already happened, according to preterists. It happened in AD 70, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. So by nature, preterism is more uh, optimistic, and post-millennialism is by nature optimistic. So a lot of preterists like to be post-mills, but it's not necessarily so. You can be on-mill which is a little bit more pessimistic, and be a preterist too. You can even be a, a pre-mill preterist too. I think I've heard of one or two of those. It's not, it's not common, but it can be. So, but I'm not going, so I'm not going to talk about that. And the millennium is a complicated subject. That's worthy of several videos. And uh, uh, that topic itself is worthy of, of several videos. And I'm not going to talk about historicism, about the Turks invading Rome. I don't really care about that. So we're going to skip that. Now, some final words. Why does orthodox preterism even matter? Why does it matter to you? Why should you even care about this? Well, for one thing, it is an antidote for pessimillennialism, for the fear that is so often engendered by the futurist uh, eschatological ethic, if you will, of doom and gloom. Preterism is by nature a fairly optimistic eschatology, or at least it's more compatible with an, es uh, an optimistic eschatology. Preterism promotes the integrity of the scripture, I don't have to read Matthew 24, 34, where it says that all these things will take place before uh, all these things will not pass away uh, before Jesus comes. And I don't have to worry about that because I know that those things did take place in AD 70. Preterism promotes a proper interpretation of Jesus' parables. When there's a parable that says that king will come and burn down that city, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about the burning of Jerusalem in AD 70. And preterism opens up an interpretation of New Te Old Testament prophets, especially the prophet Daniel. Uh, Daniel fits so well with the preterist interpretation, it's, it's almost exciting, really. We'll talk about that, too, when we talk about Daniel. Now, I don't expect you to become a preterist overnight. Of course, uh, I didn't become a preterist overnight. But I would like to ask you to keep an open mind. Um, you know, I know it's not easy to keep an open mind if you've been brainwashed like I have been, or I shouldn't say brainwashed, but if you've been immersed in uh, Hal Lindsey, apocalyptic, futurist, 
eschatology for all of your life, like I have been, I know how hard it is to get out of that. So all I'm asking you to do is keep an open mind, see if what I say is consistent with itself and with Scripture, those two things, and I know that that does not prove that preterist eschatology is right, but it does prove that it might be right, and I think that you will find that uh, with a high degree of probability that the preterist view of Scripture is, uh, is, is most probably correct. Now, thank you very much for listening to that brief and very quick overview of this uh, playlist in my Pretty Good Bible Studies channel. If you are interested in subscribing, uh, you may do so uh, by uh, clicking on the link below or on the end screen that follows.